Hello and welcome to our podcast pager. I'm George Milner. And I'm Stan Dale. Tune in to hear us talk with some amazing people about the subjects changing medicine today. From stem cells to mapping the brain and medical ethics, we hope to give you a glimpse of the bright future ahead through discussions with some of the people making it happen. Hey everyone, and welcome to series two of the podcast. I think this episode will end up being the second episode of the launch, as George has just beaten me to uploading. The last series ended quite abruptly. George and I both realized we sort of had to shift our focus over to our finals. But with those out of the way, we're excited to bring you more. So for this series, we've recorded conversations with a really wide range of excellent guests. Uh, The format will essentially be the same, with maybe a few tweaks and new episode types that we're considering. But you can still expect an episode each Sunday for the duration of the series. So with that out of the way, today's guest is Sanjay Sina. Sanjay is a clinician scientist, meaning he's both a consultant cardiologist while also leading a research group at Cambridge's Stem Cell Institute. The focus of the episode is his group's development of a stem cell-derived cardiac patch, which could regenerate damaged heart tissue. Now, I think the simplicity of that description doesn't do justice to how cutting-edge the group's work is or how profound this sort of therapy would be. What typically happens when the heart is damaged is that rather than repair, the heart undergoes fibrosis after cell death, such as you get following a heart attack. Now, this scar tissue isn't functional. And as Sanjay pointed out during the episode, half a million people in the UK alone have compromised heart function as a result of this. So it's a significant source of morbidity. We also discuss the actual process or recipe by which these cardiac cell types are derived from stem cells. How Sanjay juggles clinical and research responsibility as well as Sanjay's thoughts on regenerative and personalised medicine more broadly. We really enjoyed recording this, and we hope you enjoy it too. So without further ado, I bring you Sanjay Sina. Yes, Sanjay, thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure to be here, Stan. Thank you for for having me. Would you mind just breaking down for me again sort of what you do as a doctor and as a scientist? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm a a clinician scientist, so uh, I wear two hats. I'm a cardiologist at Adam Brooks Hospital, um, so I see patients with chest pain, breathlessness, and just manage them on the wards. And I also run a stem cell research group at, within the Cambridge Stem Cell Institute. And that's a group of about 12 people, and I manage their research. Uh, so I, I sort of balance both of those. And you were telling me that when you're working in the hospital, you work for sort of a week at a time. And during that week, you are solely working as a cardiologist. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, it actually works out quite well because I have uh, a week where I'm consultant of the week. So that week is devoted entirely to clinical work. And that's fairly full on. I mean, with uh, referrals, I'm responsible for all the cardiology in the hospital. Um, and I don't really have time to think too much about research while I'm doing that. Um, but it does mean that when I'm not uh, on the wards, uh, and that's only about one week in 10, then I have time to devote to other things. And the pace of life is a little bit Uh, a little easier uh, and I can focus more on the research and of course I'll continue to do my clinics where I'll see patients in a in a clinic setting or we have clinical meetings but those are timetabled throughout the week. Do either of them when you when you so for example once you finish the week working in the wards does it take you a while to kick back into the right gear to be thinking about science or are there either do either of these presumably there's a bit of a compromise in terms of just continuity with both of them because you're having to split your time. Yeah, I mean, th- there is the issue of trying to balance both things. And so, but, but you, it gets better as you, as you spend more time doing it. And, uh, you know, the, there's a, a little frustration when you're, when you're on the wards and there's no time for anything else and you're aware that things need to be done on the research side, but you're just putting them off for that week. Um, and then when I'm back on the research side of things, uh, it's an end to the clinical, but it isn't an end because obviously the patients continue in the background. They're being managed now by somebody else, but I do have ongoing commitments uh, in some ways. So uh, the, the, there is a, a, a need to juggle, but you do get used to it. I mean, you know, I've been doing this for a while now, so um, it's uh, it's something I enjoy. If you haven't got the hang of it now, then, then you'd be in trouble. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, well, why don't we speak a bit more about the work? Because I, I think it's fair to characterize, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you sort of explain exactly what it is your lab is is doing. Yeah, I mean, we, we work with um, human uh, stem cells. 
And our aim is to come up with new treatments uh, for heart disease uh, using the technology that we have and our understanding of human embryonic stem cells. Um, and, and, and really, we, we work in, in, in our technology is that we generate human cardiovascular tissues, so heart muscle cells that make up blood vessels from stem cells. And we use that to in two main approaches in the lab. One is for uh, heart regeneration. And the other aspect that we're very interested in is to do disease modeling. So effectively, I call this disease in a dish. I'm very happy to discuss both of these uh, things with you. So when you're when we're talking about the regenerative side of that, growing tissues that you might put back into a, a future patient, is it just the sort of the cardiomyocytes you're interested in, or is it also the, the vascular endothelial? So we are trying to um, develop strategies to regenerate damaged heart. And it isn't just cardiomyocytes. Uh, one of the things that we're particularly interested in is how the different heart cells work together. And they do work together. And I don't think that just focusing on one cell type will give us the best uh, response. I think we have to think about how all the cells uh, work together. And we've done work to show that actually there's a lot of interaction between different cell types. Uh, and only I think if we take that into account, will we come up with the best uh, best solution. I'm sure it complicates growing these cells um, sort of in culture outside of the body, though. If you're If you're thinking about cultivating different cell types which are going to be interacting with each other so th there are different ways to do it and you can uh, have techniques where you can generate it, lots of different cell types all, all together but that tends to be less controlled so what we prefer to do is have a, a very controlled situation which is chemically defined so we know exactly what the components are when we're, when we're growing the cells and then we can generate cardiomyocytes smooth muscle cells endothelial cells epicardial cells at fairly high purity and then we put them together let's say we're making an engineered heart tissue so just in a culture dish a piece that we can re-engineer a heart muscle that will contract it, all the tissue cells are generated from embryonic stem cells so there's lots of cardiomyocytes but lots of other cells such mm -hmm. as epicardial cells that actually help that heart muscle to contract um, and we can then precisely control just how many cells we put in how many cardiomyocytes how many epicardial cells how many endothelial cells and then we can vary the, the, the proportion and see what works the best so that's why we generate the cells um, individually and then put them together uh, at a later stage the analogy i'm thinking of is almost like a titration you know the sort of things you did in chemistry at school you're titrating the different uh, proportions of cells to see what functions best yeah exactly exactly could you talk to me at all about sort of how 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 are we even able to make these cells in vitro in, in the first place? Yeah, so we, we, we start off with pluripotent stem cells. So these are either human embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. These are cells that can form any cell or tissue in the body. And what we try and do is we try and push them down specific differentiation pathways. So, um, and the way we do this is using cocktails of growth factors, small molecules, that nudge the cells and provide the signals that they would have had in a developing uh, uh, embryo. So we're basically taking our cues from developmental biology and trying to reproduce that in, in a culture dish. So talk me through, okay, it sounds like you're working from base principles about what we know about how different lineages in the body sort of develop uh, in the embryo. But how do you, how do you refine that process over time? Like, sure, I can pick a bunch of factors and molecules which I think will differentiate a given tissue. But how do I decide when and for how long to uh, add that to the tissue? Um, sort of what is the, the learning process with that? How do you build on an yeah. established protocol? So, you know, we, 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 we know what, what the developmental biologists are telling us in terms of what growth factors are important, what combinations of factors. But then we have to apply that to the system. Uh, in, in our cell culture uh, models. And so we then titrate different concentrations of factors in different combinations to see what actually works best, what gives us the best cardiomyocyte at the end, what gives us the best smooth muscle cell, and so on. So it, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a little bit empirical, uh, and it's a little bit of educated guesswork based very much on what we know from developmental biology. But once we have a combination of factors that approximates, um, that, that gives us the best outcome, we, we, that's what we... And, and uh, that's what we sort of use as our protocol. And those protocols are then refined over time as we find that other things 
uh, maybe help to make ourselves more mature or increase the efficiency or compress the time and so on. So the protocols we're using are in a constant sort of stage of evolution. And some of them are empirical, some of them are inspired by what we know from, from developments. I suppose there are a few sort of um, probably functional assays you might do on the end products to, to sort of see how well they work. Yeah, and... Exactly. So with um, endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells, we can put them together in three dimensions and say, will they make blood vessels? Will they make tubes? With, uh, with a heart cell, we can put it into a engineered heart tissue. So we put them together in a, in a, in a gel and then these uh, heart muscles will contract and you can actually see this thing beating in front of you and you can actually measure calcium flux, you can measure voltage, you can measure the force it generates and the idea is can we optimize all of that in a dish and that gives us readouts about how well we've done, you know, how well have we generated these cardiovascular cells and tissues. In getting involved in this area of research, um, have you had to sort of expand your thinking outside of kind of biology that you might typically be taught in, say, an undergraduate or a medical course, and so perhaps more bioengineering stuff? Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's one of the great things about science, that you're constantly coming up against sort of the limits of your own knowledge. Uh, and it's the only way you move forward, really, is to, is to then stretch yourself. Um, we've worked with uh, material scientists and to try and actually develop a, a, a patch. So we, we can generate cells, we can actually inject the cells into a damaged heart in an animal model, and we can show that it actually regenerates uh, and improves heart function. But the thing is that you have to put a lot of cells in there, and the cells, are 90, more than 90% of them actually die. So we thought it'd be better if, if the cells had something to attach to so we could actually put a whole construct, a whole patch onto a damaged heart, which might work better than cells on their own. So we've been working with material scientists here in Cambridge, um, Ruth Cameron and Serena Best, who have a technology to make a collagen uh, scaffold. Uh, and then we put special peptides into these uh, collagen scaffolds so the cells have something to attach to. Uh, and then we put different combinations of our cells into there. So we've basically generated a, uh, a BT cardiac patch. Uh, and the idea is it's not just heart muscle, but it also has blood vessel cells in there as well. And we're now testing this in our models to see if this works better than just injecting cells in by themselves. That's remarkable. And uh, would you mind telling me a bit more about sort of the potential applications this had could have for treating human disease what sort of diseases are we are we talking about yeah absolutely um i mean everybody uh has knows about heart attacks this happens when this happens a, a, a blood vessel blocks off and part of the heart muscle dies so the heart itself then becomes weaker and that's called heart failure and there's probably about half a million people in this country who have weak hearts because of uh, heart attacks and coronary artery disease and the heart muscle never grows back once it's damaged it's damaged for good so and, and if you've got heart failure your chances of living uh, more than five years are only about 50 percent so this is a serious condition and we have treatments for this but none of the treatments the tablets that we currently have restore normal heart function. None of them will restore the loss of the heart muscle. So what we want to do is patients who have heart failure, we want to actually use this patch to try and restore normal heart contractility. So the difference between the existing therapies and what you would like to do is that, say that there's been some death of heart cells and that's been replaced by sort of fibrotic tissue, scar tissue. Current therapies are just trying to improve the function of the muscle that is left. Whereas ideally, what you're saying we could do with a patch potentially is um, is actually replace those muscles themselves. Sorry, the the the, the cells themselves. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's right. Um, current therapies, um, whether that's diuretics, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, these improve the function, the loading, the remodeling of the heart as it is. They don't really change the underlying problem, which is you may have lost, um, you know, a billion cardiomyocytes. Mm. You, have, you know, you may have lost half your heart muscle. 
And what we want to do is to artificially generate heart muscle, a cardiac patch in a lab, and basically have this for a surgeon to then implant onto a damaged heart so that the function of the heart can be restored back to normal. I mean, when you think about it, cells have the potential to completely change the way we treat diseases which are currently just treated with drugs. I mean, this is now really opening up the field of conversation or expanding it. But um, sort of, do you think that cells are going to be kind of the, the new therapies changing the way we treat diseases in the next 10, 20, 30 years? I think I think this is uh, the exciting, a uh, really exciting part of medicine, uh, and we call this regenerative medicine. There's a huge potential here, I think, for replacing uh, cells and tissues that are damaged. And I think you know when we've been talking about heart disease and heart failure, but other areas uh, are also open. Uh, you know, there's a huge amount of potential, for example, in diabetes, to replace the beta cells that patients with diabetes may have lost. For example, in Parkinson's disease, to replace the dopaminergic neurons that patients with Parkinson's are lacking. So the, the, there's a, a huge amount uh, of potential to replace damaged cells, damaged tissues um, by using stem cells to generate healthy functioning tissues in a whole range of organs. Uh, you know, the, the examples I've given you really are just the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. Do you think that the sort of funding bodies for research um, have caught on to how transformative this could be? Has the funding caught up with the potential? I think there's two answers to your question. I think a lot of people are very excited about this, including the funding bodies. Um, th th this is something that everybody wants to see working. However, this is also something that I think is um, it's something that will take time to get right and make sure that we can deliver this to patients safely uh, and effectively. I see, I think from my understanding at least, um, sort of in the early days of stem cell biology and stuff, there was a lot of um, quite gung-ho, not really evidence-driven uh, stem cell injections being given. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's right. I think um, we let the, um, our hope get ahead of this sort of evidence. So a lot of this work that was done and went very quickly into clinical trials wasn't entirely um, evidence-based. So what we're trying to do now is work uh, a little bit more slowly, make sure we have the evidence, we know what's going on at a cellular level, at a molecular level, uh, and then taking it one step at a time to get into uh, clinical studies. What are the, sort of where are we at with the development of this patch? What are the next problems to solve? So um, we, we, we know that the cells that we have, they can regenerate and restore function in uh, rodent models. So the challenge is, what's the best combination of cells? What's the best combination of cells with scaffolds to make a patch that functions? One of the problems people have used simple patches, and you can put a patch onto a heart, but the patch doesn't connect with the rest of the heart. There's a fibrotic layer between the patch. The patch doesn't get vascularized, so it doesn't get enough blood vessels to supply this heart patch with the blood vessels. So those are some of the challenges that we need to overcome. And we think that our combination of materials and our combination of cells will overcome some of those challenges I've just spoken about. There are lots of other issues to think about. One is, what about the immune response? When you put a patch of cells into a patient, what sort of immune response will that patient have towards the patch? Do we need to immunosuppress the patient or can we come up with a patch that could be um, hypoimmunogenic? So I've got colleagues uh, and, we're very, and we're collaborating with them who are working on stem cells that are hypo or non-immunogenic. So these have had the uh, HLA class 1 molecules that the immune cells recognize actually removed genetically. And those cells may... Uh, may not require immunosuppression to use them in a clinical context. So we could generate cardiovascular cells from that kind of stem cell. So that there's the whole issue of immune uh, of the immune response to consider. Mm. The other aspect to consider is actually scaling this up. I mean, when we make a patch for uh, treating a rat heart, the patch is the size of my, you know, the, the, the fingernail on my little finger. 
But if I need a patch for a human heart, it has to be the size of the palm of my hand. And that's a huge increase in size uh, and in terms of numbers of cells. So that's an engineering challenge. Uh, and, and then there are safety considerations because we're using stem cells to make cardiovascular tissues. Um, and a stem cell can proliferate indefinitely. So there is a potential that a, if we put undifferentiated stem cells into patients, those cells could grow out of control and could potentially lead to tumor. And so that's something we have to be absolutely sure is not going to happen before we start clinical trials. So there's the whole safety issue to consider as well. And I suppose the safety issue could be exacerbated if the molecules you're talking about removing from the surface of these stem cells um, might be important in order to prevent the immune rejection, might be important in presenting um, in sort of in sort of signaling to the immune system that they've transformed into cancerous cells. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and this is you know the, the immune system uses these uh, molecules, the HLA molecules, to uh, to basically um, you know survey the cells in the body. And if there are any cells infected by viruses or that might be tumorous, the immune system would normally deal with that. And if we start manipulating that, then there is a risk. So, you know, another option is to actually engineer a, a kill switch into the cells that we put into a, a body. So, yes, it can regenerate uh, a damaged organ, but if necessary, we could get rid of those cells. Now, the more we engineer a cell, the more we modify its DNA, we just have to be absolutely sure that we haven't done anything unintended to other parts of the genome so that the cells behave as they should. So these are you know, things that we will need to consider going forward. And I think we have to be absolutely happy that the cells we've engineered, we've engineered in the way we wanted to. We haven't affected parts of the DNA um, that are remote, um, so we don't get any unintended consequences. So again, these are some of the challenges I think people are grappling with. I, I, can, see why, um, I can see why you've had your hands full. It seems like the solutions to problems multiply more problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we know where we want to get to, um, and there's there's a number of uh, of challenges in the way. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of very good people um, uh, working on these, and I can see that we're going to get there, and that we will come up with regenerative uh, applications. Um, so, uh, and, and and I can see how we're going to get there too. So I, I just you know it, it it will probably take a little bit of time. So, but these are problems that can be that can be solved. And like uh, and like yeah. you said, um, research with the aims of developing therapy. Do you think it's important that you have a clear idea in your mind of what the goal is when you sort of embark in an area of research? Um, I think it, it, very broad question. That is a broad question. And if if you if you're in if you're trying to answer a specific clinical issue, for example. Um, patients who have heart failure, how do we treat them? Yes, it's quite clear what the endpoint needs to be um, in terms of, of, of a therapy. But it, it, more broadly, I mean, research throws so many things at you that if, you, if you're very focused, I mean, you have to be focused to get to your, 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 your goal to come up with your therapy. But actually, I think being open-minded as well, um, and you, it doesn't, it isn't a bad thing because you end up going in directions and, and and, and, and trying things that you may never have done otherwise. So it, it, it's a balance, I think. Mm. Out of that process arise all these new ideas and new thoughts and pieces of information, which then, in, to some extent, modify where you're aiming or, or, or the kinds of experiments you're doing. It does, actually, yes. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of this, because we, we never started off trying to regenerate the heart. What we were doing was that we were trying to make smooth muscle cells, which is blood vessels. And we wanted to make uh, coronary artery smooth muscle cells. These are the uh, coronary arteries, the blood vessels that supply the heart with blood. And these are the ones that go wrong, these coronary arteries, when somebody has a heart attack. And to make a coronary artery, the coronary artery smooth muscle cells come from epicardium, this lining around the heart. So we thought, well, fine, we'll make our stem cells form epicardium. And then the smooth muscle cells that we generate from that, they will be coronary smooth muscle cells. So that was the idea. So we came up with a way of making epicardium in the lab. And yes, we can make smooth muscle cells from that that look like coronary smooth muscle cells. 
But actually, what the unintended consequence was that the epicardium itself was interesting because of the way the epicardium crosstalks with the underlying heart. So during development, if you don't have epicardium, the heart doesn't develop. And you need a crosstalk between these two cell types for the heart to develop normally. So we wondered, well, if the epicardium is so important for the heart to develop normally, would it help if we were trying to regenerate the heart? And up until then, people have been putting in heart cells into uh, animal models of, of heart attacks to try and regenerate the heart with some success. So we said, let's put in epicardium as well, because it might be providing signals for the heart cells to survive and work well. And that's what we found. We found that the combination of epicardium and, and heart cells work better than just heart cells by themselves. So that's an example of what I'm, what I'm saying. Is our goal was to make coronary smooth muscle cells. But actually, what we found on route was that the epicardium had this amazing interaction with heart cells. And that's led us onto and opened up a whole new area of research for my lab. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, and also, it's also a fantastic segue to talking a bit about um, the work you do trying to sort of model diseases as well as the regenerative yeah. stuff. Could yeah, and, and so a bit like that. And that's that's the other half of my lab is we what we do is disease modeling. Um, we use embryonic stem cells, um, the, uh, or rather induce pluripotent stem cells, and these are taken from patients. So we can take uh, skin biopsy, um, culture skin cells from from patients, and then we can using just four transcription factors uh, based on the techniques pioneered by Shinya Yamanaka we make what we call our induced pluripotent stem cells that are just like embryonic stem cells. And these cells, again, we can turn them into any cell type. But because we've taken them from patients, they've, if the patient has a genetic mutation, then these cells also have the same mutation. So when I make a blood vessel cell from somebody who has a, a disease that causes, let's say, a, a, a blood vessel uh, disease such as an aortic aneurysm, then my blood vessel cells in a dish have the same mutation and actually show the same cellular and molecular abnormalities in the dish so what we have is a disease in a dish and you that's that's a sort of a powerful tool for understanding how that disease progresses and happens and all of those things yeah I, I, absolutely so we, we, we've done this for a number of diseases well, one of the ones we've done it for is marfan syndrome which uh, patients have a mutation in a gene called fibrillin it's an extracellular matrix protein and they have lots of abnormalities um, throughout the body. But what really affects these patients is the aorta, the main blood vessel that comes out of the heart. The walls are weak and the, and, and the aorta actually starts to dilate. It almost ends up like a little balloon. And that can tear or burst. And that's absolutely catastrophic. And what we've done is we've taken uh, IPS cells, made them from patients with Marfan syndrome. We make smooth muscle cells. And we can see that the smooth muscle cells behave abnormally. They don't have um, healthy extracellular matrix. The cells themselves are more prone to dying. They don't contract as well. So essentially what we've got is the same abnormalities we'd see in a patient's aorta, but in the dish. So we then use that to say, well, what are the mechanisms? What are the molecular mechanisms, the signaling abnormalities in, in our disease in the dish? And can we come up with drugs to try and improve matters in the dish? So we screen for drugs using this uh, this model. And then once we've come up with new molecules that could work as drugs, we can then take them either to animal models or even into patients. I see. So it's sort of a, a high throughput way of, of looking at molecules and compounds, which um, which might be useful for treating the disease. Yeah, I mean, so exactly. We, what we can do is generate a complex human model of a disease in the dish. Now, this means that we, we can use drugs that will hopefully behave in a similar way on, on human cells to what they would in patients. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges in this field is that often when we have mouse models of disease, we come up with treatments, and these treatments can't then be tr translated. They don't work in patients, even though they work really well in mice. Now, mice are great models. I wouldn't say don't use mouse models. Could a humanized mouse model be valuable? Yeah, and people are using humanized mouse models, but there are limits to how much you can humanize a mouse. And there's no humanized mouse models for uh, aortic diseases, Marfan syndrome, for example. Okay. Uh, so, yes, we can use mouse models, but this gives us another tool. 
So I would say we can use this for high throughput uh, drug screening, test what drugs work on this, test what drugs then work on mouse models as well. And then we have a better chance of these drugs being successful when we go into clinical trials. Are there any sort of diseases you're uh, interested in looking at in the future that you haven't looked at so far? Yeah, I mean, we're interested in diseases of, of blood vessels. So we're, we, we've been um, looking, as I said, at aortic disease, but we're also interested in cerebrovascular disease and strokes. Mm. So there are a number of genetic diseases that cause stroke. They're quite rare. Um, so there's a disease called Cadacil, which is caused by a mutation in Notch 3. And this causes small blood vessels uh, and small strokes uh, in the brain. And we can uh, basically model that, and we have been doing it to try and understand why we get these abnormalities in the blood vessels, but also why we get abnormalities in the white matter in the brain. So we're making, we're modeling this in a dish, and we're coming up with a, a new understanding almost of what causes the problems uh, in, in patients. And by looking at these rare conditions where there's a mutation in a single gene, it gives us insight into much more common conditions. So small vessel stroke is extremely common. There's, it, it, it's very, you know, th there are hundreds of thousands of people in the Britain and millions of people around the world who suffer from uh, strokes. So by looking at these specific um, conditions where there's a single gene that goes wrong, we can understand what might be the mechanisms in these much more common conditions mm -hmm. as well. They can provide sort of clues to, the, to that. Yeah, and then the drugs that, based on that understanding, we can then start to come up with new treatments and new therapies uh, that might work, not just for patients with cadacil, for instance, uh, but also for patients with a whole range of small vessel stroke. Um, okay, I'm, I'm rapidly aware that we're running out of time. Hmm. Um, sort of, if all the things you'd like to achieve in this area of research you you get done within the next given time frame, sort of, is there anything else which has really caught your attention or what you'd like to look at if you had the time? You know, I mean, so I'm, I'm really interested in how we can actually use the, the, the sort of technology that we're already using, but in a much more um, widespread manner. So uh, I, I think what we've got is a way to look at individual people. Um, everyone's different, their DNA is different, and this is the, the sort of era of genomics. People are sequencing patients and finding out what are the differences in the DNA that make them either predisposed to certain diseases or perhaps do or, or don't respond to drugs. But there's such a wealth of genomic information, it's quite hard as a clinician to make sense of that. If I know my patient's DNA, how do I then say, well, you're going to develop this disease or this drug will work for you and this drug you'll have side effects from? How do I do that? It's actually very, very difficult. At the moment, I'd say it's impossible to really apply that information in a useful manner for most doctors. But the, the, when we make um, iPS cells from patients and, uh, and, and, and generate cells from them, the cell has all the DNA and integrates all that information. So iPS cells taken from patients might be a way to represent that patient um, and their response to drugs. So will a patient respond to a drug? Will a patient get a side effect to a drug? So rather than just talking about modeling specific diseases, we might be able to expand the repertoire of using iPS cells to make this much more precision medicine or even personalized medicine, where we can uh, direct therapies to patients who will benefit from them and not give the drugs to those patients who won't, and also avoid side effects and reactions to those patients who would maybe suffer from drugs that we give them. So that I think is a, it's, it's a big task, but I think that's possibly where we may be heading. Sanjay, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. Fantastic. I've had a really uh, great time talking to you, Stan. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the Pager Podcast. If you've enjoyed it, then head to Spotify or iTunes to hear more. As ever, we'd love to hear what you think, and you can reach us via our Facebook page or by email. See you next time.